Um, uh, I'm now going to ask um, our chief guest, the Excellency Sardar Masood, uh, President of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, um, to um, you know t tell us a little bit about what's going on and his input into this meeting, please. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's evening here, but good afternoon, everybody in the United Kingdom. Um, Mr. Fahim Kiani, thank you so much for hosting this uh, virtual conference. This is very, very timely. timely. And, and in fact, fact you started, started this trend because uh, nobody was speaking on Kashmir. And uh, uh, last month, you uh, started with uh, one conference, and now you have held many conferences. Now, before I deliver my remarks, I would like to recognize all these MPs, honorable MPs who are sitting here. And I'm touched by your presence because I know that the United Kingdom is in the midst of a crisis and yet you decide to show up for Kashmir. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Paul Bristow, uh, who um, organized this conference, hosted this conference in February this year. Also, Jess Phillips, who organized a very successful conference last year. And uh, I understand that uh, Paul Bristow lost his father, so my condolences, deepest condolences. And I understand that uh, Ms. Kate Holland, um, she has a sick relative and still she, has, she is participating in, in this conference. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Andrew Gwynn, thank you so much for taking a very firm and forthright stand on the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, particularly Labour's policy on it, and uh, your efforts made a difference. Um, I would also like to um, address everybody. I mean, I would like to mention Steve Baker, uh, Sarah Britcliffe, I have Alison Thewlis from SNP. I would come at some point uh, to Scotland because uh, I've been visiting the United Kingdom, but I haven't had the um, opportunity to go to Scotland. So next time. And uh, then we have Richard Bergen, Jonathan Gullis, Anthony Higginbottom, Marco Longhi, uh, Ulam Muhammad Safi, who's here, Altaf Bhatt, and uh, uh, James Daly. I hope I haven't left anybody. So I'll uh, rush through my remarks very quickly because we have lost some time. The first point that I want to make is that we uh, feel for you. I mean, the, the people here in Azad Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir feel for the people of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, you're facing this pandemic. It has hit the United Kingdom hard. And uh, there are 240,000 confirmed cases of infections and some 35,000 people have died. So my condolences to the United Kingdom, particularly to the families and to the entire nation. Uh, I remember that when I used to go to the United Kingdom to the House of Commons or House of Lords, you would open doors for me and for the Kashmiris in the committee rooms and you would hear us out. So now you're passing through a trauma. So uh, I, please accept my condolences and sympathy and expression of solidarity with you. In AJK, we've been hit by the coronavirus. We've done well so far. The confirmed Cases are about 112, and uh, uh, the rest of the uh, patients have in fact recovered, and only 35 are getting treatment, and there has been only one fatality. And we've, of course, put together an, an elaborate structure to deal with this crisis. Uh, let me now go to the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir, uh, particularly in regard to COVID-19 first. I think that uh, you've rightly chosen the subject for today's discussion. There are two lockdowns there. There's a lockdown or a siege that dates back to August the 5th, 2019. And uh, that was a punitive lockdown that was in fact, first there was an invasion and then occupation of the territory and uh, then an asphyxiating siege uh, that was imposed on the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, <clears throat> The people of Jammu and Kashmir are not getting the kind of treatment and care COVID patients should get because uh, they do not have the adequate number of ventilators and PPEs and masks and sanitizers. So Kashmiris there are afraid 
that uh, because of this negligence, uh, this region might become a hotspot for the coronavirus. And uh, second, they think that uh, they might die like animals. Uh, so uh, there is a palpable fear there. I think that uh, you would recall that after August the 5th last year, um, India had incarcerated thousands, thousands of, can you, can you hear me? Thousands of prisoners. And um, the bulk of these prisoners were young boys and children, uh, as young as uh, um, 11 and 12. And uh, the number was 13,000. Nine international human rights organizations appealed to India to release these prisoners and political activists, political prisoners. But India has not paid heed to uh, this appeal by these uh, international human rights organizations, the United Nations Secretary General, and also uh, the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights. Now, the <clears throat> more tragic thing is that India has used COVID-19 as a cover for its uh, uh, despotic, and brutal policies towards the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, one thing that they have done that in the past four weeks, they have accelerated a killing of young men in coordinate search operations. And uh, uh, so far they have killed uh, about 20, 40 young boys and uh, only, nine, only 13 people have been a victim of uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19. So this, uh, uh, the Kashmiris are saying that the Modi virus is more dangerous than the coronavirus. Um, they kill youth uh, in cordon search operation, they blast houses. But the most vicious step that they took was the introduction of the new domicile laws or new domicile rules. Uh, you would recall that uh, last year they had uh, rescinded Article 35A and they have been trying ever since to turn the territory of Jammu and Kashmir into a colony and change its demography. What is the definition of these uh, new domicile rules? The definition is simple that anybody, I mean, particularly Hindus who lived in the occupied territory for the past 15 years, or they have appeared in the examinations of 10th or, or 12th classes, or um, they have studied uh, in the territory for seven years, they can qualify to become uh, domiciles uh, of the state. Um, now, what they have done is that they, have, they are creating space for the ex-armed personnel, for the civil servants, for uh, officials of statutory bodies, including educational institutions, for migrant workers, for uh, Hindu refugees who would be settled there. And the sole purpose is to change the demography, the demographic composition of the territory and change this Muslim majority state into a, a Hindu um, state, Hindu Rashtra as they're called. They have even reserved places for uh, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh operatives and for entrepreneurs and uh, for, for, the, for the temples. Now, these um, privileges or rights that the Kashmiris have, they date back to the pre-partition days. In fact, they were introduced in 1927 and 1932 under the rule of the Maharaja. Now, <clears throat> they relate to property, they relate to citizenship, they relate, relate to employment, and uh, representation in the educational institutions. Now, let me tell you that what is the applicable law? Um, and the applicable law is that uh, um, these uh, steps that India has taken, uh, they are uh, a clear violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, particularly it's Article 49, uh, Additional Protocol 1, ICC Statute, Rule 130 of the International Humanitarian Law and United Nations Security Council resolutions on Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, there have been ceasefire violations in the recent past. 
and there have been 900 violations since January this year. And in the past months, India has violated uh, the ceasefire line uh, frequently uh, with lethal impact and uh, nine deaths and 60 injuries. Uh, they have started using heavy weaponry that includes uh, um, the artillery um, and also uh, high caliber mortar, mortars and automatic weapons. In the uh, occupied Jammu and Kashmir itself, what has happened that uh, there, there, there's been resistance, there's been, been a pushback, a backlash to India's uh, revival of atrocities. And uh, uh, India has started uh, firing at uh, these demonstrators uh, using pellet firing shotguns and many young people are losing their eyesight. So there is this direct confrontation between the demonstrators and the uh, Indian occupation forces. Uh, when they gun down these boys, they do not release their bodies to the families and this creates tension. And uh, this has led to escalation of the situation in the occupied territory. Now, <clears throat> when they fire across the line of control, what they do is that uh, the Pakistani armed forces never uh, fire on the civilians on the other side of the LOC because we consider them to be our own citizens. We only engage military posts. But what they have done recently is that uh, the Indian troops have relocated uh, their posts uh, in, the, in the villages so that they can use those villages and, uh, as human sheets. Now, I'm coming to the concluding part of my presentation. Uh, what, 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 what are we seeing? What we are seeing is uh, demographic changes in the occupied territory. There is a serious peril of war um, because um, the Indians have been talking about war, attacking Azad Kashmir, taking over Gilgit Baltistan, in fact, uh, starting uh, proxy wars uh, in Pakistan. So there's this jingoistic rhetoric coming out of Delhi uh, from its uh, leaders, political leaders and also military commanders. Uh, this, what we are witnessing is, all, is uh, a beginning of an armed uprising. Um, this is indigenous and um, the Indians from time to time resort to these uh, fabricated lies. They tell that uh, Pakistan is starting a new chapter of terrorism or is uh, launching new entities. This is all false. Um, I call it um, Indian commanders fog of lies because they think that everybody, everything would be lost in this uh, fog of lies. Uh, while the rest of the world is preoccupied with uh, the coronavirus. And as I mentioned earlier that uh, the Jammu and Kashmir territory might become COVID-19 hotspot, um, Kashmir is no more related to the national aspirations of the people of Jammu and Kashmir in their political future. Unfortunately, because of the fascist policies that India is pursuing, it has become now part of the civilizational war that India has started, a religious war that India has started. So um, the uh, civilizational fault lines of this conflict are becoming much more relevant now. It is now Hindus versus Muslims, which we do, did not want uh, in, uh, in the beginning. So uh, simply I can say that this is a toxic brew and uh, because uh, what we see there is that uh, there are these, uh, uh, these uh, crimes against humanity and uh, genocide and ethnic cleansing and war crimes being committed in the territory with impunity and without accountability. The crux of the matter is that uh, we should strive to put an end to the uh, egregious human rights violations strive for the realization of the right to self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, strive for the implementation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions. This is all about diplomacy. I've been a diplomat all my life, 
And I can tell you that uh, diplomacy works if we are persistent, if there's collective political will to resolve an issue. And the alternative is war, and war is not going to resolve this problem. You know what, we're pursuing diplomacy through these conferences also, so that we can manage the anger of the entrapped and besieged Kashmiris, because they have no outlet. Uh, and that's why it is so important to uh, keep these conversations going. Uh, I would say that if there is another pandemic more lethal than the COVID-19 pandemic, that would be this pandemic of peace and security in Jammu and Kashmir. This uh, war and peace situation, peace uh, situation there. And if this, uh, Kashmir explodes, if there's a war, if there is a large scale uh, uh, militancy or resistance, armed resistance, it would affect not only Kashmiris, India, and Pakistan, it would affect the entire world. Now, <clears throat> what is the way forward? And the way forward is that uh, I would appreciate, as uh, Mr. Steve Baker did in the past, many other friends did, that we should have a full fledged debate um, in the House of Commons even is in these difficult circumstances, because uh, we need to shine a lot uh, light on the crimes against humanity that are being perpetrated in the occupied territory. Uh, Prime Minister's question are, I think that, that that's a very good venue for raising the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. It has been uh, raised in the recent past. You know, people in the United Kingdom, they walk on eggshells because they say that, well, it's a bilateral issue. And what we want to underline is that it's not a bilateral issue because even according to the United Nations Security Council resolutions, which everybody subscribed to, they say that India and Pakistan would create an enabling environment for ascertaining the wishes of the Kashmiri people. The Kashmiri people will decide and determine their political future. So it is genuinely a trilateral issue and it, uh, the United Nations has a role to play in it. So debates in the House of Commons, in the House of Lords. Um, I think that uh, after Brexit, uh, the United Kingdom's position in the United Nations Security Council has become even more important. And you can uh, demonstrate leadership on the issue of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, it is difficult, I know your limitations. But I think that if uh, you start these conversations and take these conversations to the Security Council, I think we can steer the Council towards focusing on this issue. And uh, you, uh, the friends who are sitting here today, they can in, engage with the Human Rights Council, also communicate to the leadership uh, of the multilateral forums like the United Nations Secretary General, President of the General Assembly, High Commissioner for Human Rights, President of the International Committee of the Red Cross, because these are gross violations of human rights. Uh, I would stop here and uh, I'm keenly looking forward to listening to you. And once again, thank you so much for being here um, for, for Kashmir. And you touch our hearts and uh, um, I don't know how to thank you for, for, this, for this gesture and for this, uh, this large presence of uh, such uh, luminaries, such this brilliant cast that Mr. Fahim Kiani has been able to assemble. Our esteemed guest, um, the President of Jammu and Kashmir to address us if he has any final comments um, before we call an end to the meeting, because I know it's, it's quite over the schedule. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'd, I'd be brief. Uh, <clears throat> first, um, I congratulate you, the hosts, for holding a full discussion. What I heard was uh, a grounds for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. So thank you so much for organizing this virtual conference. Second is that uh, I want to make a distinction between the COVID-19 lockdown and uh, the earlier lockdown dating back to August the 5th last year. The purpose of uh, COVID-19 lockdown 
which has been enforced all over the world is to save lives. And everybody has to participate in this exercise. Whereas the purpose, stated purpose of the earlier lockdown in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir was to kill, to torture, to brutalize, to gag people, to um, enforce a communication blockade. To, so um, this distinction must be kept in mind. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, Mr. Andrew Gwynn had raised a point about uh, uh, diplomacy and he introduced a facet which is third party mediation. And uh, I agree with him. When we talk about diplomacy, we include third party mediation in it. And he referred to the Good Friday Agreement or he also to the Oslo Accord and also to Mr. Jimmy Carter's diplomacy. You know, in case of Kashmir, it could be the United Nations Security Council, the Permanent Five, or it could be a United Nations Secretary General's Envoy, or later you could have probably some brilliant former Prime Minister from the United Kingdom or Norway. Uh, we would welcome uh, their mediation. But in mediation, I'll add a caveat. And a caveat is that this time around, you should include Kashmiris in those parlors and negotiations because sans participation of Kashmiris, you would never be able to find a solution, an enduring solution for the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. Uh, <clears throat> all the Kashmiris are asking for is uh, diplomacy. We want to set up peace tables. We're talking about uh, negotiations. And uh, this is no sin, this is no crime, this is not militancy. We're talking about negotiations and diplomacy. I would also agree with Mr. Steve Baker that uh, United Nations is evidently abdicating its responsibility and uh, by not paying attention to the Kashmir issue, the United Nations Security Council and the United Nations Secretary General are demonstrating dereliction of obligation and duty. You know, in, you must have seen that the United Nations has been sidelined miserably uh, in the present crisis also. I mean, you listen to these aspirational pronouncements and these didactic uh, moralizing by the United Nations on different issues. But in fact, um, it is the international financial institutions the Bretton Woods institutions, who are the leaders. So the United Nations has just been included in the dramatis personae as, uh, as, uh, as a commentator. So I think that if, as you have rightly pointed out, that if it doesn't take cognizance, it doesn't take cognizance of the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which imperils peace and security of the region. And every day we witness gross and consistent violations of human rights. What is the United Nations doing to fulfill its obligations under the Charter? Let me also um, underline that this persecution of Muslims in India, uh, this is not just an India-Pakistan issue. This is not an issue that impinges on the fate of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. This is now a global issue because you see recrudescence, revival of the ugly monster called fascism. It's in a different garb. This time it's, no, it's in the garb of religious supremacy. So um, I think that uh, as somebody said that this should not be ignored or swept under the, carp uh, swept under the carpet because of uh, economic considerations. Uh, I'm also very satisfied uh, that uh, today what I heard from all the MPs uh, was cross-party. I mean, there, there was a consensus on some key issues. When we are criticizing India, or we are basically um, criticizing the doctrine advocated by the BJP and the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, because the, this doctrine of Hindutva, which is in fact uh, 
um, uh, violent extremism. And that's why we criticize it, not Indians. Indians uh, have a very rich and pluralist fabric, and that includes um, Hindus and Muslims and Christians and uh, Buddhists and Sikhs. So, uh, in fact, many of the Indians, millions of uh, Indians have sympathized with the Muslims of India and they have spoken up for the rights of the people of Jammu and Kashmir and we are beholden to them for that. Now, <clears throat> there are two takeaways from this conference. One is that uh, all the MPs have said, and I'm grateful to them, that they would be vocal in the House of Commons and that they would be um, uh, pushing for that debate which has been postponed. And uh, secondly, I think that uh, they have all agreed that uh, the crux of the matter is two points. And these are an end to the brutal repression of the Kashmiris and uh, the violation of their human rights every day. And the second key point is the realization of the right to self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir as mandated by the United Nations Security Council. So uh, I would uh, finally thank uh, Yes, and I, I would now thank uh, Mr. Fahim Kiani and uh, for, for hosting this event. For all these MPs who have come in a, in a large number, I mean, somebody mentioned it, uh, that uh, um, under these uh, conditions of lockdown to assemble um, so many uh, prominent leaders, parliamentary leaders, um, is uh, no small deal. And therefore, I thank uh, Mr. Fahim Kiani for doing that. Mr. Ishfaq Hussain, you have moderated the session very firmly, uh, very politely, uh, but uh, in a very precise manner. So thank you so much for doing that. And I'm grateful to all the MPs uh, who have shared their thoughts with me and who've listened to me uh, when I made my presentation right in the beginning. Thank you, uh, uh, President. Um of Azad Kashmir and also all the MPs and dignified guests who have joined us. Um, we're, we're all working to, to make a difference in Kashmir and uh, I'm delighted to have so many of you and so many uh, esteemed personalities uh, supporting us in this cause. So thank you again um, to all of you. There's one point, if, you, I, if I have your permission, I just want to add one point. And that is, uh, you know, the, United Kingdom Parliament is very active. And uh, uh, you would recall everybody uh, who's here in today's conference, they would recall that in March this year, the European Parliament had in fact introduced half a dozen resolutions. More than 650 European parliaments had introduced um, these resolutions. And uh, they had uh, reacted to the anti-Muslim steps or uh, laws in India and uh, violence against Muslims. And in those resolutions, although they, they were postponed, they could not be um, uh, discussed in the European Parliament and passed. Uh, but in those resolutions, there were two key points. One point was they said that uh, if India presses ahead with with its fascist policies against the Muslims, the consequence would be that uh, there would be uh, statelessness on a massive scale, unprecedented in the history of mankind. There would be movement of these Muslims and other minorities towards all parts of the world. And the second thing is that in one of their operative paragraphs, they urge India to implement the UN Security Council resolutions on Kashmir and respect the right to self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, which is recognized by the United Nations. So what I want to say here is that um, the United Nations 
the, the United Kingdom Parliament, the British Parliament, can act as a catalyst in mobilizing other parliaments, like uh, the European Parliament. You have colleagues there, you've left the Parliament on, uh, only recently. They still rely on your expertise and on your wisdom. And uh, you can also uh, work with your colleagues in the US Congress, because uh, US Congress, in the aftermath of uh, August the 5th, steps taken by India, um, it held a series of hearings to shine a light on the um, depredations in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir and uh, the steps taken by India to disenfranchise the citizens of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So I think that working with the US Congress colleagues would be very important. Their congressional leadership and also their parliamentary, uh, their, their uh, congressional committee leaders. Um, I would also, because we need all this to build international opinion. I mean, here we want to resolve this issue peacefully, um, not in a theater of war, but around negotiating tables. And that's why it is important to work together to um, build international public opinion. Of course, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we're trying to reach out to the international civil society, um, like human rights organizations and uh, citizens, citizens forums. But I think that you are much more influential. Uh, your voice has credibility, uh, not just in your constituencies or in the parliament, but beyond that, I mean, um, you can talk to 10 Downing Street and you can influence policies there, or you can uh, interact with the FCO. But beyond that, you have, of course, you are the United Kingdom, and somebody said it is one of the most influential countries in the world. Uh, your outreach is uh, much greater. And therefore, if you act as uh, this group of uh, parliamentarians, if it acts, as a, a catalyst, um, probably the support for the Kashmiris or the support for the uh, um, a democratic solution of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute can grow exponentially. Uh, this was one final thought that I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency Sardar Masoud Khan, President of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, Honoured to have you as our chief guest. Thank you to all our MPs once again uh, for taking the time out of your busy Sunday schedules. Um, really honoured to have you um, and all the cross-party talk that's going on. Um, also um, to our guests who joined us from Kashmir, Ghulam Mahmud, Safi from the Indian Occupied Jammu and Kashmir and um, Altaf Ahmed Bhatt of the Indian Occupied Jammu and Kashmir as well. So thank you all once again. And, um, you know, uh, I can't emphasize enough what this means to us, and I'm sure it means a lot to the diaspora of the Kashmiri uh, community in the UK as well, as well as uh, in Kashmir itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, you for giving thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Everyone. Thank you very much.